When we were kids, me and my sister weren't allowed in the swamp, which is exactly why we wanted to go back there and see what it held. When you're that age, which was around the sphere of seven or eight, a swamp looks like some kind of forbidden wonderland. In some cases, it looks like an entirely different planet altogether. I wonder if my parents knew that it was only a matter of time before we gave into our impulses. They had told us to go outside and play because an argument was ramping up between them. So, we knew they were going to be really distracted with each other and would not be paying us any mind until they were done with their scuffle. Even after that, it would take them some time to come around to the present world and recalibrate their priorities. So, me and my sister were practically joined at the hip as we stepped into a world that was so different, so terrifying, and so wonderful all at the same time. We were consumed by the different sounds and colors and forms. Every single thing had some form of slime, but didn't seem to be anywhere that you could sit down without getting wet. That's the swamp, go figure. And every single place looks like it could have been a living thing that would swallow you up as soon as you let your guard down. We began hearing a terrible sound. It was that of crying, and it almost sounded like it could have been my sister's voice. And for half a second, I looked at her in alarm to ask her what was wrong. But she had the same expression as she looked at me. The crying continued, and we both noticed that it could not have been coming from either one of us. It seemed to bounce all over, as if it were coming from multiple directions at once. But then, we were certain that it was coming from a deeper, more treacherous part of the swamp, where everything was denser, the water, the foliage, the trees, and the apparent lack of light. We were torn between going to investigate and seeing what we could do to offer help or go to get our parents first, both of which were solutions that had critical problems. If we went to get our parents, we would be admitting that we went to the swamp when we were not supposed to, and they were already angry. Lord only knows what our punishment would have been. If we went without our parents, on the other hand, well, things could turn out badly for anybody that decides to set foot in that swamp without an adult. In the end, we decided to go in without getting our parents first. I guess if you're reading this, you probably shouldn't be too surprised. The sound of that crying was tugging on our hearts just too hard. Drawing in closer to the crying brought us into a thick mist that we had not seemed to notice. Before long, visibility was much more limited than we thought. My footing suddenly disappeared from underneath me, and if I had not crammed hold of my sister's hand, I might have gone under. I found a patch of something that was completely liquid, like it could have been quicksand or something, maybe just thin mud, but there was enough of it and too little of me to keep me above it. There, my sister held on to me helplessly to keep me from going under completely, and both of us stiffened up when the crying began to melt into chuckling and then into giggling. My sister, bless her heart, had just enough strength in her little body to wrestle me free of the grip of that sinkhole. We laid on the ground exhausted for a few moments before getting up. When we got up and were able to walk away, the giggling sound turned into some kind of rage, like somebody began screaming angrily, except it was much deeper and rattling and terrifying sounding. It terrified us both so much that we ran home and convinced the facing consequences of our parents. However, to look back this day, our punishment was nothing that paled in comparison to what awaited us deeper in the swamps. That will always stick with me, and even today, me and my sister still sometimes talk about it. It really gave us chills, and sometimes we'll try and speculate what it could have been. Maybe it was an animal caught in a bear trap. No, 
because it sounded too different. It was a scream like no other. Like an animal couldn't make it, but neither could a human. I'm not exactly sure, and I wish I had a recording to send to you so you could see what I mean. As always, have a great day, and thanks for hearing me. You know, there are so many, many reasons that you should stay away from the swamp. I mean, apart from the obvious dangers and creatures that inhabit them, like big snakes, water moccasins, I think, gators, alligator gar, all sorts of poisonous, dangerous animals that live quite happily in the murky waters that we really don't even know about. But of course, I learned that lesson the hard way. Now... I'll admit right now, I like to kill stuff. I consider myself an avid hunter, and the thrill of the hunt is something I can't quite put a finger on. It's an indescribable, amazing feeling. Maybe not so much taking the life of an animal. Maybe it's more so the little thrill of the hunt. I have a house full of trophies, and if I can't take the carcass home for some reason, then I sure as hell will be taking photographic evidence I make sure to utilize every bit of my kill, so not only do I keep it as a trophy, but I store all the meat as far back as I can, from backstrap to steak, you name it. If it lives and breathes, I'll try and pop a bullet, and the more you kill, the bigger the thrill. Once I had ticked off a known animal I was legally allowed to shoot. I wanted more. The buzz had long worn off for getting a deer, coyote, even bear. So I set out in different places for a more crazy adventure. I wanted to test my skills against the swamplands of Louisiana. Why? Because the terrain is incredibly challenging and at times hostile. Some sort of messed up lizard type thing that I've heard that lives out there that's apparently as big as a man. But I've also heard stories of Bigfoot too, so I don't know. For me, the experience was like honey to a bee. I had to go and find it. Kill it. I don't know what I thought I was going to find. Why I thought that somehow, I was the man to find a swamp creature, which had either managed to survive up until now, since the dinosaur days, like Bigfoot, or maybe I was looking for some kind of super breed, born from an abomination, when two animals should never have bred. But wouldn't you know, I actually did find something. And since my encounter, I've tried to do research into these things. And one thing that come up time and time again is the awful stench that these beings give off. Maybe just another indication of how they're not truly one of the gods' creations. I sure as hell recall the stink. I have caught me several skunk over the years and this was hell of a lot worse than those stinky little beggars. It was truly like something had crapped itself, spent all day rolling in it, and eaten a ton of rotten fish, and then pooped out all of that rotten fish again. You get the picture. It was a terrible culmination of odors. I was already beginning to regret coming when that hit me, but also being the big hunter and thrill seeker that I am, I knew I had a chance to kill something that only said to exist. So, getting my gun ready, I crept alongside the creek, on the lookout for anything that moved. I was pretty much ready to blast it into oblivion. So, when I sensed movement and could see the murky, stinking water start to bubble not too far in front of me, I shot at it, unloaded most of the rifle into the water, actually. And you know what floated up to the surface? A snake. Just as I was cursing and wondering whether to bother trying to hook it or leave it, something happened as a trained hunter has never happened to me before. I felt a breath on the back of my neck. This thing was right behind me. It was big. I slowly turned around. Now, I don't know about you, but I didn't actually believe in this sucker. That I would come all the way out here, kill it. But I didn't actually think it was real. So let me kind of clarify. 
I thought that the premise was real enough, and I knew I would come back with some kind of trophy. I just thought it would be like a real big lizard or snake. But it stood there, close enough for me to have felt its breath and to smell it. It's what they call the Louisiana Swamp Monster. It stood taller than me, well taller, eight to nine feet, covered in thick, dank, long, scraggly red fur, and a face covered in hair that looked to be part man, part something else. It was so terrible. It had an odor like none other. And it's even worse when it's standing a few feet away from you. It was just like a big man, a body of incredible width and size. It was also on two legs like a person, with two long arms. I noticed its feet were huge and webbed. It kind of looked like it was wearing flippers, almost. But it had arms that seemed to come all the way out of the front. It stood there staring at me, with its pure black eyes. I never felt more terror in a moment like that. It continued to stare at me, and we probably locked eyes for a good 5-10 seconds before it turned and just casually walked off, before finally stopping about 30 feet away and turning back to face me one last time. Then it finally returned and walked back off into the swamp. That was still to this day one of the most terrifying hunting encounters I've ever had, and I have seen some stuff. Now, after doing some research, I know for a fact that these things, these wood boogers, are real. I guess they don't only live in the woods of North America, but the swamps too. I think in Florida they call them skunk apes. I don't know. This is the first and only time I've ever seen one in my life. I almost wonder if maybe I got too close to its territory. I'll never know. When I go camping, I go camping. I don't go to any pre-arranged, pre-cut campsite where all my needs and problems will have been anticipated. Now, I take my tent and I go out into the wilderness. I probably camp in some places that I'm not supposed to, but that's the thrill seeker in me. So I have to admit after one incident, the thrill seeker in me isn't as thirsty as it used to be. I had set up camp in the middle of a small swamp. I liked being surrounded by life, and nothing is more teeming with life than a swamp, surprisingly. It was in the early evening when the swamp itself was darkening, but the sky above was still bright. I chose to look around my area then and see what I had at my disposal. It was while I was patrolling around that my footsteps, suddenly, sounded very wet and heavy. I looked down at my feet to see that I was actually stepping in very dry parts of ground. The heavyweight stomping came to a halt after my own footsteps did. I continued walking and keeping my ears open, observing that my own footsteps, the sounds of my own footsteps, were very natural and light. But then there were those heavy, wet, noisy footsteps that tried to be in perfect sync with mine. They tried to start moving when I started moving, and they tried to stop when I did. I looked around frantically, unable to stay calm. I couldn't see the other source, even though it sounded like it was right next to me. I couldn't see any footprints in the mud, and I could not ignore my instincts any longer. I began packing up my gear. While I was probably overdoing this, something powerful gripped my shoulders from behind. I swung out blindly, only to see that there was nothing and no one there. I was practically running out of the swamp, and again, the heavy footsteps matched mine, but they ceased when I had run a good distance. Has anybody else or you had any experiences being pursued by things that you can't see that insist on matching your footsteps? Any answers would be greatly appreciated. I took it upon myself to go fishing in a body of water that was located in a dense, dense swamp. It was probably an illegal move to make, but I couldn't resist. 
I had to see just what kind of fish could be caught in that environment. I had set everything up and got my line cast into the water. I was starting to feel really relaxed and even settled in. I wasn't sure why, but I couldn't check the feeling that I was being watched. Not that anyone was looking at me closely, but something was aware of me and seeing what I would do. The more I tried to write this off as paranoia, the stronger the feelings got. So much so that I was spending more time looking around than concentrating on my fishing. And when that happens, you know that something has really dug into my mind. After I got back to staring at the water, I noticed several sets of ripples coming from the same place. They were coming from a large mossy rock. Sure enough, it was sending out steady sets of ripples that weren't coming from everywhere else in the water. I couldn't tell you why those ripples might be near us. Figured maybe some fish had gotten underneath the rock to shelter from dangers, but something was a mess about the rock. This I found out to be fact when the rock appeared to move and tilt slightly, and then out of the water. The rock raised a head that could have passed as a short-nosed crocodile, except the eyes were close together and the nose was short. The face even kind of looked human, with the high cheekbones and the stern eyes. The eyes even had a separation between whites and irises. It flicked out long enough and looked over my direction. And this was the strangest looking reptile I'd ever seen. I grabbed my fishing gear and I ran out of there in such a hurry. It terrified me. And even recounting this experience, even though I'm typing it, still gives me chills. I hate thinking about it. And I'm hoping that writing this out is therapeutic. Enough for me to forget about it at least. Or get over it. Whichever happens first. Back in the 90s, my parents took me to Disney World. Alongside the usual theme parks and Mickey-shaped ice cream, my dad insisted that we do a couple of other local attractions, because what a total dad thing to do, right? So, we headed down to the Everglades for an airboat ride, covered head-to-toe in bug spray, not remotely looking forward to it, but knowing dad, he probably spent a small fortune just for this trip alone, and he wanted to have fun too. And wouldn't you know it, it had been baking hot and humid every day since we had gotten there, and as soon as we arrive on the boat, it starts raining. Now, you might say that it doesn't matter if you are on the water and get wet. Well, it might not matter if you are in the water, but it sure as does if you are on the boat on the water because then you get to spend the damn afternoon in damp clothes, praying that the spray doesn't come off, and you are now wet and hot, thus perfect environment for tons and tons of mosquitoes. So when we arrive, we are the only people dumb enough to turn up, so the excursion to maybe see some gators ends up being just me and my dad, as even as my mom decided to chicken out and hunker down in a coffee shop instead. I remember the pilot was pissed, but oh well. We were about 20 minutes when we were hit by the worst stink I have ever come across, and I was a teenage boy who played high school football. There spent many hours in locker rooms and buses full of other stinky, sweaty teenage boys. My dad actually had the cojones to look at me, as if to ask if I made that smell, and what are you eating, boy? The pilot was even starting to look a little nervous, so much so that he accidentally swerves the airboat a little fast, taking a corner, and we sway about. My dad called out. The pilot turned around and apologized. I distinctly remember thinking, we haven't gotten an airboat pilot who gets seasick, surely. Make sure you get seated and keep your hands and feet inside. Now, I'm not going to lie. I was equal parts WTF, scared and totally excited by what I was staring at into the boat, or what was staring at us. It was tall like a man, but covered in this real rusty reddish kind of hair. It kind of reminded me from that movie, 
Harry and the Hendersons. But this creature was much uglier. Much uglier. It was making this weird throaty noise. Like when you've gotten a bad cold and are trying to clear the phlegm from your throat. It was headed our way. It looked right at Dad. Then right back at me. Then right back at him. My dad was beside himself. In terror and shock. And the pilot was basically shouting to hold on and trying to turn the boat around fast. Here I am clinging onto my seat and we sped out of there like no tomorrow. When we arrived back at the docking area, the pilot ushered us out super fast and we were back in the coffee shop with mom while she was still on her first coffee. The entire way back, my dad was asking me, what was that son? What do you think that could have been? Could it have been a new species of swamp ape? What was it? He wasn't sure, and I could tell he was still terrified, but the color was coming back to his face. Well, apparently, what we had seen was known as the Florida Skunk Ape, a Bigfoot-type creature that apparently lives in the swamps of Florida. Before this, I had never heard of such a thing, and if I had, I was sure to think of it as lore, a fake ghost story. Although this creature never appeared threatening or hostile in any way, its size alone was more than intimidating. It was like a giant bodybuilder. I mean, this thing was huge, utterly massive. Unfortunately, I didn't get the best look at its face. I mean, I can get a general idea, and I was right about the Harry and the Hendersons. But when I say uglier, I do mean its face was uglier. Its eyes must have been either very dark or black, because I couldn't really make out any detail of that part of its face. It's a story my dad and I share with certain friends and relatives. Some people believe us, other people don't. But that's my experience with the Florida skunk ape. I had a phobia surrounding swamps and wetlands, so it was only a matter of time before with some coaxing with from my friends, I was challenging myself to confront my fear. I chose a swamp that could have been worse, but it also could have been a little less claustrophobic. But I digress. My friends walked around the place with me so that I could get acclimated to the environment. After a while, they decided they were going to abandon me and leave me by myself. The bad part of this is they were not telling me what they were full on planning. At the time, I didn't think they did it because I thought it was funny. It probably did, like a mama deer that gives their fawn a few minutes by themselves just to see what they're really made of. I found out in a hurry that I wasn't made of anything good. You talk about one scared man that came pretty close to peeing himself. Actually, that's only half the truth. I did manage to wet myself, but it wasn't because the swamp. I started to hear a whining, whistling sound. You know, the kind you hear from somebody who is trying to breathe, even though they're heavily congested. There was movement around me in the swamp, and I thought that my friends had come back for me, and we were going to have a good laugh about how they abandoned me, and we would all get the hell out of there. But it didn't quite go like that. The shapes moving all around me turned out to be these creatures that were built similarly to armadillos, except walking on their hind legs. They had long, bony spikes on their tails and head, very small heads actually, that kind of extended on thicker necks and very scaly bodies. Their heads would sway from side to side, and they began walking in circles around me, and admitted that it almost sounded like a chant, or a song, or some sort of strange grunts. Heedless of the risk, I darted between them and broke their circle. I ran blindly, heedless of whether I collided with a person or a tree, or even ran off a cliff. I blacked out before I could find out what the end result was. I woke up, surrounded by my friends who looked at me as if they had seen a ghost. To this day, I'll never be able to explain what I saw in the swamps that day. 
I have never heard of, or even seen, or even thought of a creature like these. Do you have any idea what these are? My grandma used to tell this story about something that had happened to her when she was much, much younger, before she even met my granddad. She was staying with her grandparents in their cottage, which at the time was surrounded by thick woodland and streams, kind of like something out of a picture book, she described. She and our great uncle Henry would play for hours and hours, those being the days when there was little else to do or before the worry of kids being abducted by weirdos. One day, near the end of the stay, my great uncle Henry had caught a nasty cold, bad enough that he was sent back to bed, so my grandmother went off to play on her own. She wasn't wearing a watch, since they didn't really wear those back then. It was always Henry's job to try and keep an eye on time. He was much better at time management, as always had been, and before she knew it, the sun was starting to set. She realized that she had gone further in the woods than usual, since she had been so caught up in the game that she was playing. She didn't exactly panic, but was certainly feeling a little anxious about being able to find her way back quickly before it got too dark. Again, it was Henry who had the good sense of direction, and my grandmother was always caught up in something in her own mind, still is to this day. Mother told us they used to say she was away with the fairies. As she began heading back in what she hoped was the right direction, she noticed one of the many streams that they sometimes waded through. Since it was getting dark and the sun had lowered, so had the temperature, and she was mindful that she did not want to get wet and end up in bed. But then she saw these fairy lights, she described. That was how she referred to them, even after we had explored every different rational option. Fairy lights, which she decided must of course be the fairies helping her find her way home. I'd like to find a 14-year-old these days who still believes in stuff like that, but it was simpler times, and actually, she ended up being an illustrator for children's books, so I guess that was always in her. Anyway, as she followed these lights, she began to wonder just for a moment if they were helping her, because as she passed a big tree with a rope on it, she could have sworn that it was the opposite direction to the house and was in fact further towards the boundary where they were not supposed to cross. But, being Mrs. Dolly Daydream, she couldn't remember why they not meant to go that far, despite the initial feelings of resilience. She trusted the fairy folk implicitly and knew they couldn't possibly be trying to cause her any harm. It began getting darker, and she could just about see the lights guiding her now when she heard her name being called. She stopped where she was, listening to the voice, and suddenly her granddad and one of the neighbors appeared. They cried out to her to stop, since she had no good sense of where she was going. They asked her to come to her slowly, which she did, and she noticed her fairy friends had disappeared. They didn't say much until she was safely home, her grandmother hugging her. It turned out that she had only been a few feet from a very steep ravine, which was full of sharp rocks. It turned out that the water was a lot deeper where it pooled from the stream, and there wasn't a lot of health and safety back then, People just relied on common sense not to go near these places. When they'd ask her why she was walking that way, she told them about the fairies lighting the way. They told her then that they didn't want her going back out into those woods. Apparently, the lights were really a thing, but they weren't tiny lanterns being held by tiny fairies. They were will-o'-wisps, and they were not something to be messed with. They were actually trying to lead my grandmother to the ravine and hoped that she would fall and hurt herself, or worse. Thank God her granddad found her in time. That's my grandmother's story, and she's retold that to me so many times that I've luckily been able to formulate enough to share with you. I've always found it interesting, especially the prospect that they're actually being real-life fairies. 
I've only heard this a few other times, but it's usually like in Ireland or England, not so much in the woods of North America. But my knowledge on fairies is very minimal, so you'll have to excuse that. Since you seem to be the cryptid guy, I figure this is right up your alley, and you'll probably be much more educated on it. So, enjoy. I took it upon myself to start tramping around a swamp that I knew was private property, but I don't know if it was government property or personal property, but signs were posted everywhere, and there's nothing like a cheap thrill to round out your weekend. And that's when I heard this peculiar sound. It was a combination of heavy breathing and a sort of strange squishing sound. My first thought was that somewhere, something could be stuck in the mud. I started honing in on the sound, and it appeared to be coming from what I initially perceived to be a larger rock. When the rock moved, the rock switched to tail, and I realized that I was up against something much bigger. Its back seemed to be this hardened carapace, not unlike a tortoise. It seemed to be aware of me the moment that I became aware of it. It raised its head and looked at me with two very tiny black eyes. I was too fascinated by its bizarre features to notice right away the stains on its lips and its claws as it slowly chewed. Half a second later, my heart was slamming in my chest because I noticed this thing was a carnivorous predator. It was eating on a dead alligator, or so it looked like. After that, I ran, and I ran, and I ran, never having seen an animal so bizarre looking or looking just like this one. My feet were taking me further than I needed to go. Either this thing was too slow, or it simply showed no interest in me. I've tried to do some research, but I have never found any such creature, nor has anybody heard of any such thing living in the swamps. I'll tell you one thing. It was new for me, and I don't ever wish to see it again. <laughs> 